And this is a little, this is the last message in the series on our families like this. It's a little different type of message, but I think so needed. We need love in the home. And uh, sometimes if we're not careful, our children look forward to getting out of the home. They look forward to getting away, getting, I'm not talking about even when they leave home, I'm talking about just going to someone else's house, go do something else, they want to get out. And we ought to work to create a home where we enjoy being together. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy being with other people, it's great, good times. But we ought to work where it's not just fun if sometimes two people get married and they just want to act like singles still. The guy still wants to go out with the guys all the time, the lady still wants to go out with the ladies all the time. And there's nothing wrong with that sometimes. But then they have children, and now they still... It almost becomes a bother. Now they still want to go out all the time and out all the time like that. And the children, instead of them learning, the children do their own thing. Instead of them learning to all be together as a family and do things together as a family, work together as a family, uh, clean the house together as a family, all these different things, enjoy fun times together as a family, they end up living separate lives in the same house. And it's like people in a boarding house or in a hotel ro- uh, rooms in the same building rather than being a family as God intended. The only way you're going to reproduce yourself, or really, uh, as God said, you go and, and, uh, to replenish the earth, you, you're to multiply. The only way you're really going to do that is you're going to have to spend a lot of time with someone. You have to, it's not just about making another breathing, living human being, but that you're going to train them up. And that's what we see here in Proverbs chapter 22. In verse 6, the Bible says here, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. I've worked at different places. I know some of you have too. And uh, they would hand you a manual and say, The first day, the next few hours, you sit here and read this. And uh, you've got to read all the policies and their, uh, you know, what you're not supposed to do, loss prevention. I don't know, all different things. How many of you have done something like that? You know what I'm talking about. Okay? You've got to read all the rules. All right? When you finish reading that book, you are not ready to work there. <laughs> it just doesn't work. You, you, you don't know how that all fits in the day-to-day operation of whatever that business happens to be. For instance, I worked at Hellsburg Diamonds in, in the process of how we were to go about everything. I read it, but now I had to see it in action. Somebody had to train me and work with me and groom me and listen. My boss would stand just at the next case. Sometimes I'd be selling, and I'd be standing on this side of the case where I could reach in the case and show stuff. And there was a case in the middle, and he'd be standing just right over there, and I could see him in my line of sight, and he was just standing. He wouldn't be looking at me, he'd be looking at the side, but he was listening to everything I was saying as I was just talking to these people about explaining the, the cut and the clarity and the, all the different parts of, the, of, a, of, a, of a, whatever the ring happened to be. And then he would come up beside me after we were through and, and, and train me further and, and help me. And he would just, just spending time developing, show me. Um, he would have me when we were slow, take, take me in the diamond room and show me this solitaire. And so I'd have to act like he was, uh, you know, some man looking for his fian- or soon-to-be fiancé. And I'd take him in, I'd show him the ring and tell him all about it and why it's good, why you know, ours is better than others, and so on and so forth. All the things we were trained to do. And then he would coach me on the way to do that. And so it just takes time is my point. It takes time. Someone's got to invest in someone else. And that's what he's saying here. This word in verse 6, he says, train up a child in the way he should go. Well, you don't do that in a few moments. That's a, that's a lifetime investment. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, will not depart from him. We've looked at lots of things in this thought of the family. Tonight we'll look at this thought of making memories. How to have a close-knit family. And really, this is the glue that brings it all together. Have a close-knit family. And my Lord, help us. Let's pray together. Father, you gave us the home and family. You instituted marriage there in the garden. Lord, you commanded them to have children and multiply. And you've given us your word to teach us how to have a home and have a Christian home. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us. We are tired of seeing children we've loved and invested in live in our own homes to grow up and be good citizens, but not be godly. So, Lord, would you give a revival in our homes that we would raise children that wouldn't just be moral people, 
but they would be godly people that would serve the Lord with their life. Regardless of the work vocation they may have, they would be faithful to you and to your church and to see souls saved and be active in laboring for our Lord. So, Lord, we ask that you would do that in our hearts even tonight. We'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first institution he established was the family. And the family should be filled with memories. Wonderful memories should be had. And we are to mold our children. Remember, all of us would have done a better job raising our children, those of, us that raised, those of you that have raised your children, if we had realized soon enough that they would be raising our grandchildren. <laughs> right? You would have done a better job if I had thought of that soon enough. They're raising our grandchildren. So we're to mold them. Now, if you train them to be sarcastic, they'll be sarcastic. If you're always sarcastic with them, they'll be sarcastic. If you train them to be cynical and be negative about things, then they'll be that way. If you train them by your, your example to uh, speak against authority and, and uh, undermine authority, guess what? won't be long, they'll be undermining your authority and speaking against your authority. See, we're training them in all of life of what we're doing. But if you train them to love God, to enjoy the day that God's given and, 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 and honor the Lord in that day, enjoy their life, they'll do the same. They'll love God and live for Him. They did a study and got families together. They were close-knit, really close families. And they asked them, what do you think it is that caused you or caused your family to be a close-knit family? And, and, and they went and got all these answers. Every family, parents and kids alike, they talked to them. They said that doing things together was the key. We did a lot of things together. And the greatest thing that does this, the number one answer that, was, that does this bonding, that they said this, this was the one that kept coming up and coming up, coming up. That answer was, I'm salting your oats from the past messages, was camping. It's interesting, isn't it? Camping. Now, let me calm your fear, those of you that don't like the outdoors. <laughs> All right? The secret's not actually camping. It's what camping produces, see? <laughs> Some people think they're going camping. They get this RV, and then they have all the TV and everything, and video games, and you're not camping, you know? But it, it's what camping generates. It's a, the common crises experience. <laughs> you know, you get out there, the mosquitoes are huge, and all these different things. It's just going through common traumatic experiences together. Uh, the secret of close-knitness is having this common bond, common struggle. That's why uh, soldiers that fight together and warriors, they have a, a common bond. They, they get close-knit together because of the situation, that, that crisis that they were in. Uh, uh, football and sports players can have that same type of thing at times. Uh, David's mighty men, we talked about some this morning, had that close-knitness because of what they went through and battled together with David and each other. And uh, when those things happen, uh, the bonding doesn't pl take place when it, it just happens, but it's, the crisis is like a glue. It's slow drying, okay? So don't try to be real close to everybody at the moment. Everyone's sunburned and mosquito bitten, and you scratch and it hurts, but it's still itchy and, and uh, you know, that type of thing. Don't try to hug on everyone then, but about three weeks, it's like slow drying glue you'll have this close-knitness begins to start. And uh, so if things go bad when you try to do things together as a family, so every time we try to do anything, things go wrong. That's good. And that's a crisis you went through together. I remember fishing trips with my dad and grandpa. We lived in Manitoba. We used to fly up to Little Grand Rapids, and they only had winter roads to get up there. It was an Indian reservation. And winter roads means lakes that froze over, and they even have shows about these 18-wheelers, you know, taking stuff up there. But when I got a little older, we were in Ontario, and we used to drive up to this place every year, every summer. My dad took us even through college. It would be my brother, my dad, and my grandpa. So it would be four of us that would go every year, and we'd go up from Ontario. We'd go all the way up, 10-hour drive up through Timmins and all the way, uh, way north. And uh, then we would drive about six kilometers back south on a gravel road. It's kind of like going up 91 here if you shoot at that range ever. It was a gravel road that would have turnoffs, and there was no signs. So you have no idea. Unless you know where to go, you don't know where you're at. And um, anyway, we'd see a moose coming through there almost every year, you know. So we're way 10 hours north of where we lived in Canada, way up. And uh, we'd go and put our boat in in what was called Lake uh, Rufus. And then we'd 
go through Lake Rufus. There was a lot of houses on that lake. Then we'd go through Lake Pendleton, just a few houses there just at the beginning. And then we'd go all the way through that lake into Lake Opacetica. And uh, there were no houses on that lake, very few people around. Up northern Canada is very low population anyway. You know, there's more people in the state of New York than all Canada. And there's all the people that live in Canada, 90% of them will live within 100 miles of the U.S. border because it's just so cold up there. And so, uh, anyway, so we're up way north, and we go to this lake. We go to the same island on that lake every year. And so we'd build a little table and had little things. We, you know, and every year we'd go back to that same. It didn't have many trees on that little island out in the middle. Of the, we'd stayed there because we thought we'd keep away from the bears, and we saw the bears swimming in the lake, so it didn't make any difference. I guess they can swim. But uh, anyway, every year we'd be up there, and it was always something with, with my grandpa, especially as the older he got. Some of you people might, might uh, uh, agree, or, or this would be something you might, might say you can understand that. For him, we'd get up in the morning, and we'd be, let's go fishing, you know, be ready, you know, get out there. And, uh, and he, I ain't doing nothing until I go to the restroom. <laughs> that was the first thing for him, always. And, uh, and so we'd be wanting to fish, and some days grandpa wasn't doing good, you know, and so... We'd be fishing around the island, all three of us in the boat, and Grandpa, finally, he'd come out with a big grin on his face, and, all right, we can go fishing, you know. It was just so funny. But that type of thing, there's no restroom, so you're finding some place, you know. It was, just, it was just those things we laugh about to this day. We talk about the little things like that. Every year we go back to the same place, and, and uh, I remember going ice fishing up in Canada. The first thing we did, ice fishing, I don't like, but... You go out, and it's, it's on a shanty on a lake. The ice is frozen about four feet deep. You've got a fire inside or some type of heat source, and you've got this little uh, shanties, they call them, but it's like a little uh, a shed out there on the, on the lake, and uh, you've got four holes in there, and you're fishing out of these holes that they augured four feet through the ice. And uh, it's not fun because the fish are, are cold, and they're, they're really uh, they're like catching a log. You know, they're not, they don't fight, so that means the fun of fishing. But anyhow, you sit out there, and they jig and things, but the first time I ever went, I think the only time I ever went, the first thing I did is get in the shanty. My dad's trying to help me get in. You've got to kind of crawl through the way that, that shanty was anyway. And the first thing I do, I step right in the hole. And I'm up to here, my boots all soaked, and Dad, what are you thinking now? You ruined the whole day, you know. And uh, something that effective. Well, how are we gonna, you're going to freeze out here, you know. And so we were, had my sock and everything on this little heater thing they had. It was a mess. But so things like that, something goes bad, you go through a crisis to work it out. When we went up in Canada, there'd be big black fly, flies when you got up north. And anyone know what those black flies are? They're small black flies, but they're crazy. Anyone know what I'm talking about, the black flies up way north? Some maybe in the UP. Uh, the bad thing about black flies is they're not like mosquitoes in that they will crawl. So if you're in pants like this, they'll land on you right here, and then they'll crawl right up and bite you up there above your sock line. And they leave a welt like that. It lasts for about a week. And that thing will itch like crazy. And they'll be just everywhere thick with them. But they're really small flies, so it's not like, you know, big horse flies, something you can see. And so we, you know, who cares? There's no one around. We'd have our socks pulled up over our pants, look like hillbillies, you know. And, uh, and, but you just, anything to keep the flies off. You know, and the mosquitoes and all that. Only good thing about black flies, they stop when it gets dark. Hallelujah. And uh, they, they don't keep biting you like mosquitoes do. But anyway, it, it was just things like that we would talk about and remember and battling those flies and, and the, and the different things that would happen. You could just drive around three or four hours in your car until chaos broke out or something, and, you know, that'd be good. If a few weeks later, you'd be bonded real close. Um, but now that you, under, now that for us, we understand that when things like that happen, we were going on a trip one time, we didn't get into Atlanta, and boom, a tire blow out here on the side of the road in Atlanta trying to, you know, things like that is what bonds you together. So, you don't have to get angry about it. You can say, oh, that's all right, we'll endure this because these things is what will make us close. That's why church families get close when they go on mission trips together and they do things like that. I remember we went up to that mission trip in, uh, up in Canada and um, it was the craziest thing. Uh, one of the uh, couples we had with us, they were like drinking stuff constantly, juices and different things, healthy. But then all of a sudden, it was the guy every 30 minutes, restroom break restroom break and we were like are you serious it was ridiculous you know it was crazy pastor Kilpatrick was kind and would stop but um uh, then we we were in kentucky and the air conditioning quit working in the bus it's in july in the van and you go up the hills and the heat would come on just pouring he was actually burning the ladies feet they were holding their feet up and 
And, uh, you know, and then we'd go down the hill and I would, ah, you know. And so we, la- we were laughing about that. Then we get up, it's July 4th, we get up Lima, Ohio, and the alternator goes out on the van. They're like, oh, no, everything's going to be closed. We were just a couple hours from getting to where we were going. And uh, finally we found an auto zone. They happened to have the exact alternator we needed, and it was still open. The other place, the Vance, was already closed, but that one was open. And, and so we had tools, but they were in the front of the trailer. All the luggage was packed in behind, you know. And so the pastor said, when well, are you going to have to dive up there? So they got a picture of me diving up, my feet hanging out the back of the trailer. They're holding my feet, and I'm reaching down to try to get them. got cut up trying to find, got the tools out. And then we're all holding this little milk crate for Pastor Kilpatrick. He was trying to get high enough to get down because he knew what he was doing to change the alternator in that van. It was nuts, you know. And we laughed about that and talked about that. Just things like that bind you together. And uh, those, those crisis things. Then we got there, and they, they didn't have any vehicles or anything to run for kids. They'd never had a VBS at that church. And so we prayed. We sought the Lord. And God just blessed. We met this one girl, and she brought 20 the next day. It was just crazy. that just, She just knew everybody. She was younger than everybody, but she was known there. It was just it was exciting to see the Lord work and people get saved. And, and what a blessing uh, to see God do something. So the pain brings game. Everyone goes camping, the mosquitoes are huge, that's great. You know, the bigger the better. <laughs> if everyone goes on a picnic, someone forgets the main ingredient, wonderful. You'll be bonded, that's perfect. If you go on a trip, car breaks down, awesome, you know. In fact, if you go do something with your family and nothing goes wrong, maybe next time, you know. And you'll be really close. So how do we accomplish this? How do we get it done? Well, by the way, even businesses are doing this kind of thing, team building things. They'll take them doing this, their business to an escape room. They'll go to this uh, big um, uh, obstacle course and go through because they realize what that team building and team bonding does in working together. Well, that works a similar way in a home, and we need that. So number one, starting to make memories. Get the whole family together. Have them list what they enjoy from zero to ten. What would be the best activity? That, what would you enjoy? It can't be something like, you know, uh, you know, something you don't, can't afford, you know. Well, we want to go to a trip around the world or something. But what types of things they enjoy, you know. Ladies might say, want to go shopping or, you know, these people want to do that. And then you, number, so what they enjoy, that's your first blank, their most enjoyable experiences. Number two, combine them. So try to see if it's things you could do in a day, do it all that day and break up the day. Depending on what it is, maybe it's things you're going to do on a vacation and you have a week to do. And combine everyone's in the vacation so everyone is, uh, is, is included and they feel like they're a valuable part of the family and you want to have them apart and encourage them. Number two, scheduling time with your family. So you want to plan these things together, begin making memories. Number two, scheduling time with your family. Letter A, family priorities. An elderly gentleman once told me, you're never done with everything. <laughs> never. You're never done with everything you need to do. So you must prioritize. I don't know if you know the secret of that and you say, oh, I've got everything done on my to-do list and I'd like to talk to you. But the truth is in life, you're never done. You're never done with everything you have to do. So you have to prioritize. Have to prioritize. Live by priorities. Number one, God first. God first. Now again, in how I live my life, I am training my children. It's not just the things I sit them down and say, okay, now when you do come against this, do this. When this happens in your life, do that. Okay? That's not training. That's like reading the manual. Okay? Uh, you can tell me 500 you know, uh, things all in a row. I'll not remember them all. I'll forget. It'll be too late. and I'll already be messed up before I realize, oh, yeah, Dad said don't ever do that. So they're living, they're seeing your life. That means you have to be around them to see your life. You're training by how you live. So you put God first, they'll see that. Number two, your wife or your spouse, if you will, if, if for you ladies to be husband, uh, spouse second. Remember, your children need to know. They need to know that your mom or if you're a lady, your dad is the most important person on this earth Okay? God's first, of course, but on this earth, they're the most important person to me. And then third, together, right? Together, you children. So children, third. Together, you children are the most important people on this earth to us. All right, number four, and I'll explain this in a minute. Work is fourth. Remember, 
It's under God still. Okay. Number five, other ministries is fifth. Other ministries, church ministries, so on. Someone says, well, you know, you said work is before that. Remember, it's under God. And so if someone say, well, my work, you know, I'm not able to do anything in the ministry. No, that just shows desire, <laughs> see, uh, appetite. If God has saved you, as we preached a couple of weeks ago, then we all have a purpose, and God wants us to labor in his work. And so he's called you to something. So you may not be able to do everything. I so appreciated a man this week that told me, I can't be at SOS on Saturday because of work, and so could you give me a place? And on Thursday, me and another gentleman are going to go knock doors. See, we can use work as an excuse, but the truth is it's just a lack of desire. Because there's time you're off work. It may not be the time we happen to be doing some ministry, but there are ministries that God's called you to. And you can get engaged in things, and you can prioritize, remember, God first. Okay. Then your family, work. Of course, we all have to work in other ministries. Well, the reason I put other ministries down there is some people get this idea of service to the point where they lose their family. And the truth is, God has service for you to do, but service isn't the goal. Worship of God is the goal. That's the goal. And out of that worship will grow the service. But the job of the servant is not to serve. The job of the servant is to obey the master. And so if God's first, those things will all fall in line, just to help us all there. So we must labor. We must schedule your life according to priority. Now look, we all have to work, so you've got to set aside work hours. Uh, then you schedule personal time every day, time with the Lord, like that. And then set aside a day, time in a day every week, and the whole day, fine, for your wife and kids. By the way, when you're involved at church, have them involved at church. We do that together. We, when our, my class, the home builders, we clean the church, our whole family cleans the church. We're all involved in that, and uh, we're, we're a part of it. We have a church work day. Our whole family is going to be a part of that church work day. We have a, the Super Saturday we have up coming up. It's not just Mary and I. All our, our girls, all of us are going to be involved in it. SOS, all of them. The whole family uh, can do it together. And then you have that in the morning on a Saturday, work day or something. That's your time you're going to be with the family. Well, that's, we're going to go to church and be together, working there. And then we're going to enjoy some time after together. And it's not all got to be fun and games. You know, my dad, we would clean the garage out. All right, Saturday, we're going to clean the garage out today. You know, well, that doesn't sound exciting. But after we got it all cleaned out, he'd always, you know, get the bikes and, and he'd, uh, you know, grease the, the chain and he would air up the tires and we'd go for a bike ride together or something. And so you can work. It's work, that's life. Life isn't fun. If you teach your kids playing a video game or, 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 or always going to do something at Chuck E. Cheese, that's life. That's not life. Those are some fun times we have sometimes, but life is work. Life is, is getting uh, what needs to be done, done. Life is preparing to, so you have something to eat and serving the Lord. Life isn't about always play, 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 so work together. And what I mean by that is you've got to plan your time. When your kids are at school, depending on how your hours are at work, if you're home at all when your kids are at school, especially your ladies that, that maybe don't work or something, do what you can't do when they're there, but save the work that you can do with them for when they're home. Uh, when Mary folds the clothes, the girls fold the clothes. Uh, when we're cleaning up after dinner, they're all cleaning up and helping the dishwasher and all the different things, that the jobs that they have. On Saturday, we have Saturday chores that are different than the rest of the week chores because we get the house back clean and, and the things you don't do every day but that need to be done weekly and so on. So you ought to do that together. It ought to be a, a, a family job. And so it's not mom has to slave away or dad has to slave away and the kids just do whatever they want. You, you work together. That's time together. That's training. Uh, one day they're going to have a garage and they have to keep it clean or whatever the things are. And so this is a part of training them. And it allows time together while the work's getting done. Uh, when us five kids still get together, we talk about when we used to, dad would get a deer. We were behind him, behind a truck one time that hit a deer and dad pulled over and, come on, help me and load the, this deer up. And we took it home, we cleaned it and dressed it ground hamburger, he cut off the parts where the was too bruised up from where the truck hit it, but it mainly hit the head, and so that was what we ate on for a while, you know, and we would process, and man, it was cold, and by, by I get home, it was in the winter, and my hand would be freezing in the garage, we're pulling the skin down, dad's skinning the deer, and all the parts to that, and we still talk about that, 
uh, we would have, we had puppies, and we all had, so dad had to scan. We had this one lady, she was, uh, her name was Tess, not a lady, but uh, a female dog, uh, she called her Spaniel. She'd have the most puppies, but she couldn't keep them fed. They'd all die. And she tried, but they couldn't, couldn't uh, quite figure it out. And, and uh, we, so we had schedule. And boy, all night long, every two hours, one of us would get up and we'd be working with those pu- uh, poor puppies and trying to get them to eat, you know. And, uh, and so we talk about that, how we, uh, we was five of us kids and, and dad, mom, mom wasn't a part of that part of it, but we'd all, you know, just, and things like that. Now, they all end up dying anyway, but boy, we were all in the battle together trying to help these poor babies and we'd have to bury them. And so just things like that draw the family together. As you work in life, for our family, Mary came up with a plan when the girls were smaller that helped us to be more faithful in family altar and devotions and doing something together as a family every night. You know, we all are busy. We want to be with our family and connect daily. And so this is what we did then. This has been a couple years ago, but Sunday was Sing Song Sunday. I remember Caitlin when she was small. It's Sing Song Sunday. <laughs> She'd say, so on the way home, we would sing. We lived in Vance, I think, at that time. It was a 30-minute ride home. And so we'd sing on the way home, and uh, like that, Monday was dessert night. And so and with coming here and all the bread stuff you get, we would, we would uh, many times be able to get something for free. We'd have dessert that night, and so they looked forward to that. And Monday was busy. We had Monday night visitation things, and so it was something we could do together and look forward to it. Tuesday was performance night. They could, uh, depending on their age, they were able to do different things, but they would sing, tell a story, quote a verse, act out a story, uh, all different types of things. I'm not to say the things that might be embarrassing, but they, they enjoyed doing something. It was whatever they wanted to do, they would do something. And they, they loved that. We all, they got all the attention at that time. Then Wednesday, we'd do story night. We didn't read a story every night, but that one night a week we would do that. And before bed, we'd have our devotions. Uh, well, on Wednesday, we, didn't, we had a story. Thursday, we'd have game night. So after our devotion, all these things would be always after our devotions. So we'd be connected. We'd have our time of family altar devotions together. And then game night, we'd do Uno. We did different things right now. We're playing the game. They got Christmas code names, and that's a good one if you hadn't learned to play that. But Uno, um, Spoons, different ones they'd be into. At the time, we'd play games. And uh, my, my family's a game-playing family. I like playing games. And uh, our, still, when our family gets together, my my. My siblings and parents, we always are playing games, playing Rook, playing Monopoly, playing uh, whatever the game is we're all into at that time. And uh, it's pretty competitive, but it's a lot of fun. We have a good time with it. Uh, Friday would be a, some, either we do an outing. We sometimes would play Wii. We like to play Mario Kart, Mario Party. We'd only, only do that as a family. Um, or sometimes watch a, a good movie. Saturday was color night. And this was an interesting one. Mary had read something about it. And uh, I'm not a big colorer, to be honest, but I was doing Curious George at that time. And uh, they let me borrow one of their books. And they, she had read something about coloring together gets you talking as a family. And so we would. We, you know, you don't have to think a lot to color. And so we'd all sit there and color for a few minutes and we'd get to talking about things. It was neat how that worked out. But that was just something we did. It doesn't have to be any of those things. It would be something totally. But planning time, prioritizing and planning. Look, what gets scheduled gets done. And if you just roll with life, you come home, you're wore out, you sit down, you turn the TV on or something, and you just, the day's gone. The kids are doing homework, or the kids are doing playing outside, the kids, there's nothing wrong with that some, but you need to have purposeful time and spent with them in training. Let her be family activities. We're not going to go through all these. It's very important that families have fun together. Here's activities you can do. A lot of them are for little money. Uh, go to the park. It doesn't cost you anything to go to the park. We used to like to go over to Joe Tucker and, and feed the geese there. You could take bread from the church. It didn't cost you anything for the bread. Or you pop popcorn or whatever. I think there's a sign there now you're not supposed to do that, but we had never known that, I don't think. Anyway, we enjoyed it. Kids, they would surround the kids, you know, and you'd have the last bit you have to throw and run because they'd be attacking you. But uh, anyway, we had a good time with that. Uh, go to Oak Mountain State Park. That doesn't cost a whole lot. Uh, go to the library. It's free books and uh, even movies you can get and things like that. It doesn't cost you anything. Some people think, well, do something with the family is expensive. It doesn't have to be. It's something small. Um, you could, uh, I'm skipping down to number 16 now, play board games. Like I mentioned, card games, we enjoy that. When they were small, we did memory match, different things. Go look at Christmas lights. That's something we still do every year. Mary, she always does things really special with the girls as far as making it special. She's good at that. she got golden tickets for the Christmas Express, and um, they're laminated, and we use the same ones every year. But uh, really fancy looking, and, and they'll find them some night on their pillow during the Christmas time. 
and uh, we'll try to distract them some way. They're getting better this year. They figured it out. We knew we saw you doing some getting stuff ready. Anyway, Mary will pop popcorn or get snacks ready and uh, hot cocoa and sippy cups when they were small or whatever and not too hot. But, but uh, we'd have everything ready. Then we'd tell, all right, y'all get in bed. And uh, then we'd run down to the car as good as you could, and they'd have this ticket on their pillow. And so also we'd hear them come running. We'd have the car running and uh, Christmas chipmunks or something playing. And, uh, and they'd get in. We knew it was tonight. They'd be so excited. And, uh, and uh, anyways, we try, to, we try to make it where they don't remember or try to trick them. And we go look at Christmas lights. It doesn't cost a penny other than the little stuff we eat. But, but I mean, you know, there's some really good people go nuts with Christmas lights. And it's free for you. Go enjoy it. Listen to Christmas music. And, uh, you know, you can get those ones that they tune in to the, your, stage, your uh, radio, and, and that's a great time. We look forward to that every year. Uh, number 21, we rent a boat at Lake Purdy. We enjoy doing that. About 30 or $40 there it was last time we went. We've done it three or four times. Uh, get a pontoon boat for an hour, and, uh, and uh, it's a good time. And lost my favorite sunglasses there. Finishing a bag of chips, I tipped it back to get the last bit, and my sunglasses fell off my head. Anyway... So that makes you close together. So, but they would drive the boat. We have a good time. We've done that a number of times. And, uh, and uh, we look forward to things like that. What about 30? Do cleaning work a day at the church. Uh, Monday night visitation, do that together. Saturday, do that together. Open your house for Thanksgiving. That's a neat one uh, to have people over on a day like that. Invite some, 37, invite some church families over for dessert and games after church. That's fun. Pop, pop, popcorn or do something like that with it. It doesn't have to be a big meal. Light candles in the house. Turn out the lights and tell stories or just talk. One of our favorite things was playing hide and seek in the dark. And uh, even when we were bigger, back when we were teenagers, we used to do it in the church. I don't know if I'm for that, but we would do that. And uh, that would be the fun. But there, there are lots of things you can do that you're creative, doesn't have to cost a lot. And there's a whole list here, and you can make your own list, but just some ideas of things you can do together as a family. And so, number, letter C, family vacations. I grew up with some young people that they actually never went on vacation the whole time we were friends growing up. And, oh, our parents can't afford that. Well, the truth is, there are lots of ways you can go on vacation without spending a lot. My parents didn't have a lot of money. We did a lot of things to make uh, money because we didn't go on deputation to go as a missionary. We went by faith, and so that's why we had the chickens and had the big garden and had the dogs and all the different things to try to make ends meet. But you can do... And we, we did. We would go do something every year. We had a couple big ones. We went to, they took us one time um, uh, to Disney World. That was a big one. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, we had to carry a sandwich and carry things in a, in a back uh, pack. Or th- and, uh, you know, we had to have a bottle of water because we weren't buying anything in the park. It's too expensive, you know. And, but my dad's brother, my Uncle Gary, had worked at Disney World years ago and had friends that still worked there. And back then they could bring four people in a day for free. And so we were all getting in for free. And so my dad, he's good at that type of thing. And uh, we would get in, and it didn't cost a lot. One day, we had to pay just for three of us or seven of us. But one day, the one guy brought his friend, so we all got in for free. And uh, I think we stayed at a, a prophet's chamber or something. And my dad did it. It was inexpensive. We didn't have the money to pay and go, but he worked it out so we could go to do that. And that was something Mom always wanted to take us to do. Uh, so there are things you can do. Uh, one of our big vacations we did is we went out west. That was one of the other big ones we did, the Rocky Mountains. Went to Banff and Jasper up in Canada, one of the beautiful, most beautiful places I've ever been. And, uh, and that was a, a great thing. Dad preached the whole way out. <laughs> Sunday we were here, and Wednesday he preached here. And, and uh, you know, he had it all lined up, and uh, so we were able to afford to go and uh, stay at different places there. Uh, always, so here's some tips. Number one, always take your food with you. Now you say, well, we can afford to do it. Well, great. Do it. You know, that's fine. You don't have to do these things. But you say, well, we can't afford. Well, here's some things you can do. Always take your food with you. Two, always visit relatives. If there's relatives, like your grand, the grandparents want to see the kids anyway. So that's mostly what we did when we went away. We'd go see my mom's kid, parents and my dad's parents. Uh, and we'd even do some fun things while we were around there. My Aunt Cheryl had a pool and fun stuff like that. Um, but even when you're traveling on the way, you could stay with relatives to save if uh, just overnight as, you, as you're going on your way. Number three, camp. Camp on the way. KOAs, different things like that. You know, in Craigslist or other Facebook, different things you can find for sale. People bought camping stuff, thought they were going to go camping, tried it once, said we're never doing that again. And it's brand new stuff, and you can get it for very little. Wash the sleeping bags if you feel funny about that, and, 
And they're like new, basically. So anyway, there's lots of things you can do that's not real expensive in getting a tent and stuff for that. Four, make an activity bag. That's something that is fun to make it fun. Activity books, books to read, travel games, uh, you know, different things like that. Maybe some tablet type things in, in moderation, different games like that. When going to theme parks, I already mentioned, take your own food, number five. They allow you to bring cooler in, stuff like that. So do that at any of these type, whether Disney World or some type of amusement park. Uh, enjoy the national parks. That's something you can do, Brother Kilpatrick, Mr. Debbie. They really enjoyed that, and they would tell us all the different places in the state you'd go to. And, but national parks are beautiful, and they don't cost a lot. Enjoy things like that. They won't remember everywhere you went. They won't remember going everywhere you go, but they will remember growing up having fun with their parents and family. I think sometimes, not as much anymore, I've kind of gotten over it, but when we were early on married and even with young kids, there were times I'd think back, boy, those were, there were some good days at home. I had some good times with some things. Not that I wanted to go back to those days necessarily, but just, just thinking back as a simpler time, you know, didn't have bills to pay, didn't have responsibilities. And uh, your, your kids, you want them to look back and think, boy, we had good times. We had fun as a family. You may not have lots of money, but that was fine. You had a good time together. Remember, you're investing in your children. Chain up a child in the way you should go when he's old and not depart from it. Letter D, family devotions. What's the purpose, number one? What is the purpose? Well, daily Bible reading. Certainly the Bible talks about that. But the purpose is daily bringing your family to Christ. Daily. So you have to remember... The only hope for our children is that God would get a hold of their heart. You can't choose that for them. And so daily, you ought to be bringing them to Christ. When Jesus was walking the earth, there was parents and families that brought their children to Jesus. They wanted them to see Jesus, wanted Jesus to touch them and things. Well, Jesus isn't on the earth in a bodily way, but daily we ought to bring them and confront them with Christ, where they have to see the Lord, where they see the Lord, where they love His Word and look to His Word. Number two, work to be consistent. Now, that's very difficult because of life. I understand that. The only problem with life is it's so daily, right? But uh, one thing that helps, number three, is use Brother Sexton's reading through the Bible by stories and other devotional guides. Have some type of guide. Our girls like to be the one that gets to do the guide and fill it in. And if you want one of those, I have some in my office. I'll be happy to give you one. He makes many of them for go through in a year the whole stories of the Bible. And I'd give you one of them. You can try it if you'd like. Speak to me after. Number four, speak to their heart. What's the purpose? Speak to their heart. Let it be a tender time. And take the opportunity, if they're small, to snuggle up with them, if they can do it without being distracted on the couch there while you, while you talk, while you read. And we, we go around as a family, and each read two verses or five verses or however many verses we're doing. And everyone reads, if they're that age, have them read it. Gently apply the passages directly to their, to their lives. You know what they're dealing with. You know their problems. They're, they're lying right now. They're having a problem with lying, so talk about that. Apply it. You know, they're fighting. They're pulling each other's hair. Whatever the things are going on in that time, uh, make the application. Things they need to work on. Purposely go through passages that deal with things that are applicable to them. So there's certain passages you know they're struggling in some area Go to those passages in the Scripture and read that. Uh, don't just preach at them, but allow it to be a time of guided discussion where you help bring them to a conclusion and an answer. What does the Word, God, Word of God have to say about that? And make the application. Where your hearts are being knit together as you teach them the truths of God's Word. Remember, you want them to begin to realize that God's Word has the answer for everything. It's reliable. It has to answer for every question. Even when they're out on their own, they can go to God's Word and get the answer for every question in life. Be excited about it. Help create a, a, a spark of love for God's Word. You can do special things. We would act out stories sometimes and act silly in it, and that's okay. Do, do some special things at times. Age appropriate, obviously. I not work if they're older, but do that, things like that. Uh, let them see your love for God's Word, which will help them develop their own love and desire for God's Word. and So you want to do things that cause that. Here's another idea. Review their Sunday school papers. A lot of those Sunday school papers that bring home have got some good stuff on it. A lot of times they end up in the trash after a while. So that'd be one thing you do one day a week. Maybe on Mondays you go over there, all right, what do you have? And you go over their paper and you talk about what they learned and help to solidify in their heart. Six, talk about things you see through the day. 
So maybe you saw something, you want to teach them a lesson about something God put in your path that day. Let me tell you about something. What God brought to mind about this, whatever. If there's a beautiful sunset, our girls are around like you hear them, boy, God's busy with his paintbrush tonight, you know. And that's something they got from Patch the Pirate. And, uh, uh, but, but that's good. Bring God into everything. You know, that's your, the desire there every day. Let them hear you pray daily. Have them in church, letter number eight, as often as possible. Remember, a Christ-centered home is a church-centered home. You cannot separate Christ from his church. Remember I said earlier, the church is Christ's body. If you want to get to know me, you're going to have to spend time around this body. If you want to get to know the Lord, you're going to have to spend time around his body, the church. See? Number nine, get them involved in Gospel Light Baptist Academy if possible. I'll tell you what a help that's been in our family. The Bible, the scriptures, they memorized. They quoted for us over the Christmas holidays. Hebrews chapter 11. Boy, they're quote, 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 all the way through. And it's exciting to hear how much they knew of it. And the Bible lessons they get every day. Bible stories, Bible memorization, chapel. What a help to a home. Now, you don't do nothing at home because that's there, but it's adding to. And think of the benefit of other godly people saying some of the same things you're saying at home. Another voice. That's a big deal. People get numb to a voice. Uh, that's why pastors bring in guest speakers. And guest speaker come in and say the same thing a pastor's been saying, and all of a sudden they heard it because it's, they get numb to a voice. And so another voice. So that's so big in your children's life to have someone else's voice saying the same things and confirming things they've heard you say. Oh, it's not just dad and mom that believe this way or do this. They're reinforcing that to, their, to, to your children. Uh, that's a blessing. That happens at church too, but... That's a blessing in the academy if that's possible for you. All right. Now we're making me memories, and we're close-knit. How do we stay that way? Number three, staying in harmony. Go to Philippians 2. We're going to end there. Philippians chapter 2. It's so quick over something so little, you know, like they say about spilled milk. Something like that could happen, and you can mess up the spirit in your home. And if you don't get right on that, people can get bitter and... You can have a train wreck in a home over something silly if you don't know how to deal with it, handle it. So those things are going to happen. Things are going to happen in your home. How do you keep it close-knit and right? How do you stay in harmony? Number three, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercy, fulfill you my joy. To be like-minded, have the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, each esteem other better themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on his own, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we don't just care about our stuff. We're thinking about the other person. We're, we're lowliness of mind. We're humbling ourselves. We're not having strife and problems. We're esteeming others better than themselves. So how do we stay in harmony? How do you detect the erosion of a relationship? And then how do I fix that? How do you overcome a major destroyer of relationships? And that is when the spirits close to one another. It produces anger when that happens. So we all have a threefold relationship with people. If uh, I was walking up and here comes Manny, I would see his face and I would, I would sense his spirit. I'd see his countenance. His, I'd see his soul on his countenance, his emotion. If he's upset or happy or however. And then we'd shake hands and we'd have physical contact. We have a spirit, soul, and body relationship. We have that with every person. But most importantly is in our home with our spouse and with our children. Is We're not just have a physical relationship and not just a soul relationship, but it's a spirit relationship. And so if you're not careful, you can wound people's spirits. And they start closing up on you. So how does that happen? Well, through loss of trust. Loss of trust can be through lots of ways. Broken promises. Anger in the home. Temper lost can cause this. When you wound someone, it creates an anger and a closing of the spirit where they're like, don't touch me. I don't want to be, you know, they get this, they're just closed off to you. Uh, if you think of a spirit like a hand, you've got their spirit and soul in here, and then this, the fingers being their body, and what happens is now it's closed, and the whole, it's all closed to you because... 
There's a wound there. Something's happened. When you're closing someone's spirit, they don't want to get into a logical argument about you, about it. They don't want to talk about logic and argue through it. They might say, I don't even want to talk about it. But what that means is, remember, so what you're saying is, <laughs> all right, uh, they don't want to talk about it that way. They don't want lectures and arguments. Think of your spouse specifically. See, feelings can come back. I've, I've known people that, I can't stand that man. I can't stand that woman. They're married. They're headed for divorce, and God can put it back together. Feelings can come back. Remember, feelings follow honor. Remember, this is just a little cufflink. doesn't have a pair. It's not worth much. But then when you found out it was Abraham Lincoln's cufflink that he had on the night he was shot, they only found one. Seriously, that boy, that cufflink's something there. It has honor attached to it now what it's worth. It's not really that, don't worry. But when you begin to look at the value of someone, you begin to honor. Feelings follow honor. Remember, when we honor someone, it'll totally change our feelings about them. So, here's an example. Here you're, you see the spirit of your wife just deflate like a balloon right before your eyes. Suddenly, you sense there's an issue. She's sending a code. <laughs> we talked about that in an earlier message. She's feeling unloved. That's the bottom line. Of course, if there were a thousand ladies watching this take place between you and your wife with their pink sunglasses and pink hearing aids, they'd all be saying, well, I know why that sweet little thing's shutting down on him. She's so sweet and tender. Can't believe it. Look how he's talking to her. <laughs> to women, the code is obvious. They decide for the message right away through the pink sunglasses and pink hearing aids. That's why they say men are so brain dead, you know. They have two brains. One's lost. The other one's looking for it. Things like that. But you turn it around, and the wife sees her spirit, uh, her husband's spirit deflate in another instance. He gets angry. He won't talk. and His behavior seems childish to her. But if a thousand men with blue sunglasses on and their blue hearing aids on are watching the same situation... They would say, I know why that guy shut down on her. Good grief. Look at the way she's talking to him. Unbelievable. You know. So what do you do? How do you deal with these situations? I'm talking little things. So, so far, people get to a divorce, they don't even remember what the fight began about. It's unbelievable. So how do you prevent that type of thing at home? It happens with parents and children. They hadn't talked in 10 years, and they argued at Thanksgiving over something stupid. Just silliness. What do you do about that? Life is passing. What, what, if, what foolishness that they neither would humble themselves and make things right. So how do you keep that from happening in your home? Well, letter A is tenderness. Get soft like a pillow in your mind, if you will. Get real soft in your mind and spirit to change your tone of voice. Maybe you need to bend down. If it's a child, maybe you need to bend down and get on your knee, one knee in front of them and Speak them at their level. Men say something that they think is just, this is nothing. It's not a big deal. It's like a tiny pebble to them. But remember, men are like buffalo and ladies are like butterflies. You know, a pebble on a buff butterfly's wing messes up the whole flight. But a buffalo have 50 pounds of mud on his back. doesn't bother him a bit. And so we may say something, do something, not even realize we've hurt them. We've offended them. So what do I do? I can see I've hurt them. Resolve it and do it right now. Do it right now. We, we talked about clearing the table quickly. No time for a root of bitterness to get in and get set up there. So get tender, get soft. Let it be understanding. You're really hurting, aren't you? See, what people need when they're hurting is softness, a tender touch. Speak to them tenderly. Not a lecture. Why are you crying? <laughs> what are you upset about? That doesn't help anything. You're just, you might as well not said anything. Been better off. But, but getting real soft. Why are you crying, sweetie? What, what did I say? What's wrong? You're, you're way too valuable. What, what did I do wrong? Help me. What, what, I, what I did was wrong. I'm sorry. If you, you know, humble yourself. Get it, get it made right. Usually that's the issue. We did something. We just were too gruff and rough and didn't recognize 
maybe they worked really hard to do something. You walked in the house upset about something else, didn't even notice they worked real hard to prepare something for you, have something ready. So tenderness, understanding. Letter C, apologizing. I've read things, people, I've never heard my dad apologize. Never heard my husband apologize. Well, that's sad, isn't it? We want to be man enough to get things right if we've messed up. Be man enough to apologize. Be man enough to own up to it. Remember, your training, show your children, this is how you apologize. This is how you get things right when you've done wrong. Will you please forgive me? Now, here's a clue. Their spirit's opening. If they're touching you, if they're talking to you, I'm talking about with your children, too, this way. And so maybe with one of them, I remember with, with uh, all our girls are different. I won't call any names, but, but uh, with some of our girls are different. With one of our girls, if you could just say something, I wouldn't even realize it, and she'd be crying. I didn't even know. Sometimes, sometimes I knew. But sometimes I wouldn't have any idea and just say something about it, and she'd just hurt her feelings like, like a flower, you know. Just her feelings would be hurt. She'd be crying, big, big alligator tear. And so you'd get down there and say, sweetie, what ha- what's wrong? What, what, you know, and you're just, it may have been nothing. I'm not, I may not even need to apologize. It depends on what the thing is, but, but I care about her. You're important. And what's wrong, sweetie? What, what, what's going on? And uh, daddy loves you. And just, just taking the time to do that, boy, she'd just dive into me and hug me and all and stuff, and, and it'd all be fine. But if you don't watch it, you can hurt them and not even realize it. I think that's why God gave me girls, you know, to help soften me. But, but, the, but things like that, caring about each other. Some people, who cares? What's the big deal? You know, they just have to get over it and learn you're the man, and that's how you are. Well, the big deal is, Make, having a close-knit family is priceless. It's priceless. And I want to share this last thing here. We're through. They won't remember everything you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. They won't remember every time you lost your temper or stuff, but they'll remember how you made them feel. They'll remember what you said when you lost it. They won't remember every time you cared enough and were concerned for them but they'll remember that dad cared and loved and he, how they made him feel. That's so important. The years are passing quickly. It's hard to believe. For our girls, we used to think there were things when we were younger. I thought, man, I'm glad they're so young they're not going to remember that. <laughs> that time's gone. They're going to remember. And so, what's it going to be like? And one day, they're going to look back at their home and say, this is what I want my home to be. Or... I'll tell you how our home was. I don't want our home to be anything like that. Well, you want to train them, give them an example to follow. May God help us. Start making memories. Schedule time with your family and stay in harmony. Don't let something happen. Cause a division that goes on and on and on when it should be so quickly dealt with if you'd just be willing to humble yourself. Say, what's, what's, what did I say? What did I? It could be ladies. You need to do that to your husband. It could be something. Whoever it is, it doesn't matter. In the end, it doesn't even matter. Just get, get, make it back right. We all, are, we all are sinful creatures. We knew that going into the thing. So someone's going to do something they shouldn't say or do, and when that happens, get it right. So your home can be what it ought to be, and God can bless it. Let's bow and pray.